So before we begin the debate, I do want to ask the, the contenders here um, to kind of just give an overview of their product and what they're working on to get the, to get the context for everyone in the audience um, on where they come from before we actually go into the debate itself. Um, do you want to start, Chris? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Zhu. I am the co-founder and CEO of Sonic SVM. Sonic SVM is a gaming SVM built on top of the base layer, allows for harmonious synchronization between our rollup or SVM or network extension, whatever you want to call it, uh, back to the base layer very, very fast. Um, and we're building a gaming ecosystem that allows for any Solana game to go to market, you know, build, scale uh, seamlessly. And that is our product. Cool. Andrea, what are you working on? Hi, um, I'm Andrea Lin, CEO and co-founder of Magic Dog. Magic Dog is a high-performance game engine for fully on-chain games and fully on-chain applications. On Solana, our core product are ephemeral rollups. Uh, we essentially allow developers to build on Solana and never leave the chain, but tap on demand into these fast SVM instances that are deployed all over the world and give the same benefit of rollups really or up chain without ever needing to leave the chain. Cool, thank you. Um, so Andre, I'm gonna start with you. Um, we're gonna start with just asking about um, why does, uh, or like your opening, uh, sentiments on um, do games need an L2 on Solana? Well, clearly we believe uh, that they don't believe an L2, at least in the shape or form that L2s are commonly kind of conceived. Um, what we think though is that games clearly need some different properties compared to what the general DM uh, that Solana offer um, can give them. And so primarily latency um, is one of the biggest concern uh, when it comes to gaming, especially if you want to enable fast-paced multiplayer games. Another one is related to the cost of transaction themselves uh, or even um, pre-compiles for customization at the runtime level. Typically game engine offer loops uh, for developers that don't get loops natively in the Solana runtime. So there's a couple of properties that are very helpful when it comes to gaming and that Solana doesn't, doesn't have. So um, there's definitely properties that we think are needed. Uh, we just don't think that L2s, um, in traditional L2s are the commonly need for that. Chris, do we need an L2 for games on Solana? Uh, uh, very obviously we do. Um, I think to unlock the full potential of Solana gaming, uh, it is necessary to have a gaming ecosystem, uh, in our case, a gaming SVM that, that is designated to the growth of all Solana games. I think traditional L2s on Ethereum, for example, actually is focused on increasing performance and speed, lowering cost, uh, and I don't think that should be the necessity for Solana L2s. I think Solana L2s can actually focus on use case specific configurations, customizations, as well as the general ecosystem building for specific use cases, in our case, gaming. Um, and, and it is very reasonable to have a craft um, or tailor-made experience for each one of these games to build on top of a SVM gaming chain. Just as some problems that it could potentially solve, Sonic existed because we believe that one, games need scaling solutions to avoid hotspots or low transaction, uh, low economic transaction values um, and keep the base layer for high value transactions. And two, um, Solana allows us to have a atomic SVM, meaning that we can have, uh, we can get rid of the redeployment process um, for EVM L2s. That was a very, very big, big problem, problem. And some might argue that liquidity is fragmented on top of you know, Solana if there's L2s. But if we look at the total market cap of all games, uh, including the tokens, NFTs, added together, without a designated gaming chain helping these games go to market, launch their assets, that total cap is actually very, very small. So we actually think about it as a use case to inject liquidity for gaming into the chain, as opposed to uh, you know fragmentation of the chain itself. I can talk about this for you know, a long yeah. time. Uh, so you, you, you brought up a couple of interesting points that I want to kind of uh, uh, drill into. One of them was, okay, so let, let's start with this question. Um, can you give me an example of a game that is made better because it's on non L2, whether it's Sonic or something else, than it would be on, a, on the base L1? Yeah, so uh, I think made better itself, uh, we can define that a little bit, right? Why do, why do games need? Uh, the way I would like to define it is the game developers are going to make more money. Yeah, uh, then a lot of examples. If we, if we look at you know what Ronin does very well, for example, Axie Infinity, maybe 
some of you already know about this game. Um, essentially, uh, after Axie's success, Rona was able to kind of capture the liquidity and the players and keep them in a decentralized community of super fans for this game, but they're also open to exploring other games. So when we talk about the generalized L1, when people's attention are not on specific games or gaming itself, it's actually very easily dispersed to you know, financial assets and so forth. One example of this recently is that uh, we're looking at Space Nation, you know, all immutable X. We're trying to bring them into the Solana ecosystem. You know, huge MMORPG by one of the best producers. They look at this metric called um, on-chain velocity of money, uh, where initially if you print money in a traditional Web2 game or MMORPG, it might only flow um, seven times a day or eight times a day. But after they brought on on-chain, because the take rate actually decreases, the users can actually sell their assets, the velocity doubled almost to you know, 12, 13, uh, and then the take rate stayed lower while the users actually had more uh, enjoyment in actually trading the asset and having the metagame. So the developers actually ended up making more money even though the users uh, gave up less. So where, why, why does that happen? It's because the economy is actually open and they're bringing uh, more velocity to the money supply. Okay, so I, I want to go to you, Andrea, to, to ask about something that uh, Chris brought up. Um, Chris just talked about uh, trading assets on chain, but I know from our conversations, um, the stuff that you guys work on, you focus a lot on fully on chain games, working on primitives beyond digital asset trading. Can you talk to me about uh, any kind of games that are made better um, with uh, not, without digital assets, but in, in, in any other kind of primitive that they could be using, and um, why they might exist on uh, an L1 or on your Sure, absolutely. I, I think there's an important distinction between games and fully on-chain games. Because when it comes to games, I think there, there's a net negative actually building those some of those games on Web2. When it comes to fully on-chain games, uh, it's absolutely impossible to build tools entirely on an L1 without any sort of uh, support. The reason why I'm thinking this way is because when Chris is talking about value accrual for developers, he's not really talking at uh, bringing Ronin as an as an example, is not really talking about making money for developers. It's talking about Ronin making a lot of money, which is, you know, a, true. They're accruing a lot of values in their own chain, um, and you cannot do that if you're on Solana. And also, when it comes to bringing more liquidity, you're bringing more liquidity to your own chain, not not to Solana. Um, so, games are actually worse off on an L2 because they don't have payments. For example, they don't have native LTC, one of the simplest form of uh, benefit that Web3 can offer to games. When it comes to fully on-chain games specifically, I think there is uh, an argument that you can uh, make that having your own L2 is actually better because at that point you might need to tune uh, the block time, you might need to introduce uh, other form of customization at the runtime level, as you were saying, that are not available on Solana. And for those sort of games, uh, I think a solution that uh, resemble an upchain could make more sense. Okay, so let me let me clarify that real quick. Um, you're saying that for fully on-chain games, we might actually do need L2s. Is that is that a correct statement? Yeah, I think for many genres, uh, they need some sort of uh, scalability solution uh, that okay, goes well, beyond is, Solana. Is it a scalability solution or an L2? That's a good question. Uh, thanks for asking. So we think there is a better way to build L2, which are ephemeral, and that's what we're focusing on. So the idea behind an ephemeral um, rollup um, is that you're not really moving the state into a separate chain. You're not really building an L2. The L2 is not real. It's just a mirror of the copy. It's a copy of the state that it exists on chain. So you benefit from persistence. You benefit from composability. You benefit from liquidity and from the incredible ecosystem that is Solana. But you can also tap into this customization at the runtime level. You can also tap into these faster performances. You can co-locate the node to reduce the latency. You basically have the exact same benefit of an L2, but without having those same problems in terms of fragmentation. And so we have to define what an L2 is. Um, we argue that ephemeral rollups are not really an L2 because they are not real. They are ephemeral. They, you cannot create new state there. Um, but when it comes to bringing transaction um, in a way into this different ecosystem, this, into these different runtimes, totally for fully on-chain games, uh, Solana, I think, um, is, is not enough. Okay, so uh, uh, Andrea just brought up a, a very technical point um, on why fully on-chain games might, might be made better on L2s. What I want to challenge you on, Chris, um, and it's something that we talked about, you, you mentioned something about ecosystem growth. Um, and one of the things that you had mentioned was um, how do you do things like, uh, you know, publish deals, value capture, et cetera, token, uh, token issuances, and break 
relate that back uh, to the games themselves. What about the SVM? What about an L2 SVM technologically makes any of the business stuff better? Technologically. Well, that's what I'm saying, right? So, so if, if it wasn't a technological need for the SVM, couldn't you just do it on the L1? If, if, if your argument is um, the L2 makes the business side better, yeah. can't we just do the business side on the L1? Yeah, so I, I think theoretically speaking, maybe you could. I don't know. Um, we think that it's a lot more reasonable for that to happen within a gaming ecosystem of a chain itself. The reason there is uh, extent of alignment is the biggest and you know one of the largest problems to tackle when it comes to you know helping games publish or go to market. Um, and you know games are businesses at the end of the day, and the developers want to be able to acquire users and make money. So when we look at a contract that we sign and help you know these games go to market or publish on top of Sonic, uh, one of the biggest problems that you, you would have on a, a you know generalized L1 is that you actually don't have protocols that are you know, specifically serving gaming needs. So um, let, me, let me challenge you on that. Why can't you just put those protocols on the L1 instead of on the L2? Like, why, for example, yeah. uh, if you talk about incentive alignment, yeah. uh, assuming incentive alignment, something has to do with tokens, why can't you introduce those tokens on the L1? Why can't you, you know? So perfect question. You can introduce the token on the L1. Actually, we suggest our devs to keep their tokens on the L1 because SVM actually allows us to have a unified interface that allows base layer to communicate to the L2 or the rollup. Um, and that is actually not previously seen on Ethereum, right? Ethereum has different standards across the different L2s. And one of the biggest problem is that the liquidity doesn't have a home base you know, to, to be shared. Uh, we can actually change that if we all agree that Solana itself is the base layer and the interoperability standard is the same by utilizing, for example, Anza's SVM API. Uh, and then we just focus on execution. And now coming back to your question, let's say a game is fully on chain. They're making money off of you know, a take from the transactions uh, or you know, sharing a part of the uh, generating gas or whatever, like however the game makes fee off of high number of transactions. Um, how do you share that with Solana through generalized L1? It is almost impossible for us to strike a custom deal with Solana uh, if there is no on-chain publishing entity for Solana itself. Uh, and then the block space, there is economic value for the block space, which should also be shared with the games. Let's let's deep dive into that because I, I don't I don't know if I quite understand that. So you're saying that um, you want to share value back to the L1. Isn't the L1 just making the value from transaction fees? Like why do you, why do we need a special way to put value into the L1? So when you say we want to share value back uh, to the so L1, the, the game developers, game developers um, who are who are making no, games. No. So I'm saying that the game developers wants to share value off of all of the transaction fees that they're bringing to the L1 or to the chain itself. But can't they do that by writing a smart contract that every time there's a transaction that goes through, some percentage goes to them as a as the take? But you uh, you can one you can capture the gas itself, right? And two, um, I think it's also very difficult for uh, all of the other protocols, DEX, Marketplace included. So if you look at Immutable Access contracts, for example, we talked about this briefly, where when they're publishing a game, their ecosystem actually utilizes Uniswap or DEX or you know, token swaps, and then they built out their own marketplace. So all of the on-chain uh, publishing deals that they actually do, their milestones are based on NFT volume. Um, and that creates an adverse incentive for any game that doesn't you know, necessarily need an NFT trading volume to be very, very high to capture value. Um, and Ronin, you know, for example, as a gaming chain, does this better by having all of the uh, necessary components, whether it be whitelisted or built by themselves, to be on top of the ecosystem so that if you're an MMORPG and you have only fungible tokens, you can also capture uh, value off of those DEX transactions. And we think that as a gaming chain, we can have all of those necessary pieces designed uh, for these games and then also share that revenue or share that economic incentive back to those games. Transaction fees are you know, one example of that, uh, but it's significantly harder to do on top of Solana L1. I'm not saying it's impossible. I haven't thought of a very well, good way well, to do it. I mean, just instead of taking transaction fees, just take a cut of the transaction, right? Like that's, that's how we do composable transaction instructions. Like yeah, so it's not just transaction fees, right? It's also all of the protocols that you're building on top of this chain. If it's not designed for the games for, for publishing, then it's very hard to convince all of these protocols to share all of those fees with the games. Okay. Um, Andrea, the, the, so Chris just talked a lot about, um, you know, this kind of composability. And you talked about composability, but in a very different way. 
choose games where you know with each other. Um, so do you think there will ever be business cases um, th th in the same way that Chris is talking about, um, where uh, games, uh, or have you seen any games that are like, hey, we want more uh, business uh, development uh, done on the ephemeral holdup that like we can't see, uh, that we don't see on the LTO or something like that? So if you're talking from a publishing perspective, I think there's definitely value that we as a, as a company can bring to, to games, but that's not the point of uh, the technology that we're building. The point is that we allow them to partner with other ecosystem actors and get the benefit from them. Uh, a very clear example is a fully on-chain game that is being built uh, right now with ephemeral rollups is built on Solana and therefore can compose with another attribution protocol that um, is built to bring players uh, to other protocols. So what they can do is that they can have this referral uh, on-chain system where if you bring a friend, you're gonna earn a cut of the fee that they're spending into the, uh, of the amount of money that they're spending into the game. That is a very simple example of how powerful composability can be. And that is only possible because you can compose on Solana with the state that is available on Solana. When it comes to cutting publishing deals, I don't think you have to really cut a deal with Solana. If you are building a custom protocol, if you're building a custom marketplace on your chain, fine, you can do the same and you can share a fee with all the game developers that are building on you. So I think it's quite easy to redistribute value to game developers if, if that's the, the deal, if, it, if, that, if that's the biggest concern. Right, but I, I think what um, Chris is trying to get at is that you have to go a step further, right? So um, you can't just build a technology, you also have to help them with distribution. And uh, as we know in crypto, distribution is the name of the game. Sure. You know, uh, help, help. So how do you help with ephemeral rollups, um, the same kind of distribution that Chris is talking about uh, for those games that might build on that scaling solution? Sure, but L2 doesn't give you any significant advantage in that. You can do the exact same thing to help in distribution, to help in publishing, and just stay on the L1. That, that's my main point. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, all right, in the last couple minutes, um, Chris, what about an uh, uh, Andreas scaling solution is better uh, for for certain games that you might see in the ecosystem? Yeah, so I actually think uh, ephemeral all of S technology is super fascinating um, for super late, li low latency, meaning on-chain games. Uh, and if we're putting all of the states on-chain, um, those are some of the use cases that, you know, as an ephemeral rollup, uh, you can probably serve better. Uh, and the optimization on the validator side uh, is probably also done very well. Uh, I, I haven't taken a look uh, at the whitelisted features recently, but I've heard great things from some of the teams building on top of it. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, when we are working with some of the uh, Solana native teams, uh, they are obviously more inclined to tap into the liquidity of Solana. And we've actually developed tech to build that interoperability layer, um, you know, just to uh, be inspired by some of the magic block features as well. Um, so I think for the fully on-chain teams that are native to Solana, um, maybe some of those games, if the, a lot of the states are all on-chain, then it makes sense to build on uh, magic block as well. And Andrea, what solutions, or what games do you think would be better built on an L2 uh, than on your scaling solution? I think what L2 temporarily offer is cheaper fees just because they are less congested and so initially if you want to build up an ecosystem really really fast um, sometimes it's easier to just deploy on an L2 because you have this sort of isolated environment and you don't have the same transaction activity or congestion that might happen on Solana but I don't think that is a good long-term solution so I think that Sonic um, is doing a really good job in terms of helping from a business point, pr point of view the games and uh, with publishing and with uh, finding players and all of this stuff that is very important when it comes to game studio but I don't think that is necessarily a technological uh, advantage uh, it's more of a, a kind of business and ecosystem play that that you guys are offering well we will have a v2 <laughs> um, thank you guys for listening to this debate um, and hopefully you all play games and if you don't play a game like you know get out and just play video games it's, it's a nice time uh, but thank you all for listening to us um, and yeah I don't know if there's another talk right after us or not but yeah thank you thank you